Some say the moon. Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. This is the story of an extraordinary project. No, no, not that one. Well, not only. This is the story of how a group of students and teachers came together after two years of a worldwide pandemic to reach for the stars. And I was among them. There, that's me. My name is Heath Hamrick. Believe me, the slacks and tie are not my choice. As a history teacher, I've spent my life looking for ways to avoid putting on a suit. Unless it was one of armor, of course. But this is a special occasion. It will be up to these students to shepherd three astronauts to the moon and back. This isn't a reenactment. Anything can happen. And it's up to these students to prove they've got the right stuff. And they might be laughing now, but I know they're nervous. How? Because at debriefing sessions during and after the project, I asked them. It's hard. It's been stressful. I'd say it's really stressful. Oh, it's, it's just been crazy. Everything we've been having to do. It's been a fun, uh, stressful uh, experience. So this is great. Everything's going great. They're worried. And who can blame them? For a month, they've been studying the Apollo spacecraft systems using an 80-page flight manual that gave me anxiety even to look at. As we head into a conference room and the kids begin to shift into their roles as flight controllers in 1969, everyone seems to share that anxiety. All right, let's find a seat. Oops. Luckily, teachers are there to alleviate that nervousness. Or share it. We're role-playing as actual NASA figures like Poppy Northcutt, Deke Slayton, and Jean Krantz, hence a buzz cut and vest. You know, it's all about problem solving and making sure that we stop the problems before they happen. And there's just a lot that we have to take care of and just a lot of making sure nothing terrible goes wrong. Everybody feeling less stressed now? Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's get started. You guys just have to figure out how to get us home. A bus ride marks our full transition back to 1969. What awaits these students is a spectacular recreation of the Flight Operations Control Center, built by educator and artist extraordinaire Lori Alsobrook. She's built Revolutionary War cannons in the decks of the Titanic, but she's outdone herself with this mission control environment. Walking into this room, it's easy for anyone to pretend that the years have leapt backwards the clock has reversed itself, and the world is waiting with bated breath, with eyes fixed on the moon. 
The students will work in three shifts or teams, purple, orange, and white. One on the consoles, one as backup, and one briefing on what lies ahead. It was a really great fun to work back here with all the teams. Y'all were like, y'all just sat down and started going through the flight plan and started being like, all right, so this, who's this job? You're the, they even wrote it up on the board and everything like, all right, so your checklist is this. What's your checklist? What page number are you on? And they had like, by the time they got finished back here and came to this part, every single person knew what they were gonna do. There's a fourth group, the Tiger Team, working on finding solutions to problems that haven't happened yet so that answers are at hand in a crisis. Unfortunately, the launch of this flight a speculative mission between Apollo 10 and Apollo 11, dubbed Apollo Gamma, is going to provide a crisis sooner than anyone expected. Commander Seth, at three minutes to launch, verify launch vehicle engine lights one through five are on. One of the most important roles in mission control is a capsule communicator, or CAPCOM, the only person allowed to talk directly to the astronauts. It's a stressful job, requiring them to work closely with everyone in the room to relay instructions to the three astronauts on Apollo Gamma. Verb 37 enter, zero 01 enter has been entered into AGC. Roger. Of course, those astronauts aren't really on a launch pad at Cape Kennedy. They're in an office at the other end of the building. RHC power has been set to off. Roger. Three awesome teachers, sacrificing a night's sleep in the name of education. Something tells me they found ways to fill a time between near catastrophes. Speaking of which. All right, follow flight controllers. We're gonna need a go, no go for launch. Booster. Go. Ready to launch the world's most powerful We've been flying booster planes rocket. Fido, go. Fido. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom. Go. i go for launch. All right. GNC. Go. FAO. Go. Guidos go for launch. Yeah. All right. All right, we're go for launch. Let's move on to booster. Let's light this candle. I just stole a line from Alan Shepard, the first American in space. I don't think he'd mind. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3. Two, one, zero, all engine running. So far, so good. But then... Houston, we just lost everything. The platform, data, guidance, everything. Disaster. The astronauts are reporting almost everything blinking off in the command module. They're strapped to a bunch of dead weight. Explosive dead weight. So we got a program alarm. Guido, talk to me. When it first popped up with that program alert, I was like, oh. Guido, flight, give me a reading on that program alarm. That's when it felt real to me, like immediately. Oh my gosh, we're all frozen like this. My stomach kind of turned a little bit. Luckily, our flight controllers are up to this first challenge. They know what the program alarm they're seeing on their consoles mean, and what the astronauts need to do to fix it. Apollo SCE to auxiliary. SCE set to auxiliary. It, it makes me think, you know, some things are you can't control. You just have to do your best. So, and you kind of have to, like, content, not content with that, but like, um, accept that. It would, and, Come to terms with it, but do your best when you can where you can. That thing to do the trick, Houston. I'm not sure we weren't struck by lightning at liftoff. This actually happened. On Apollo 12, the spacecraft was hit by a double whammy of lightning on liftoff, causing a major malfunction that was cleared up by flicking an obscure, nearly forgotten switch. Our astronauts are still alive. For now. So, 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 what's the time? Retro, where are we at on a board checklist? We should be calling them out. Apollo, we should be go for staging. Mode 1 abort checklist has passed. Uh, moving on to Mode 1C abort checklist. Go for staging, Roger. 
The launch issues aren't over yet. All right, folks, going around. Oh, go, no, go. Booster, are we go? No, no. Do we need another burn? We need another burn. Okay. We'll calculate that and get back to me. Retro. One of the boosters is cut out early, requiring a longer burn of the remaining engines. Luckily, our flight controllers come up with the figures, and finally, after 11 minutes of tension, Apollo Gamma is in orbit. So far, these students have only taken the first step in a long and complex journey, and already they've faced some challenges. Spaceflight is never easy. On any given mission during the Apollo era, tragedy was only one mistake away. But these students are coming together to work the problems and find solutions in a way that would put most adults to shame. So the coolest part for me actually was watching you guys work because I thought that um, Llewellyn over here and I both thought that, that we would be far more involved in getting you to the points uh, and understanding what was gonna happen. Um, but you guys were asking great questions immediately and we kind of stepped back and we we're just like, let it go, and we did. <laughs> um, mine's pretty much the same. I just love y'all. I mean, I've always loved y'all, but this was great to see you guys interact with each other when, you know, y'all haven't, gotten to do much of that in a while. Just watching how engaged everybody was, it made shooting the film so easy. You made so many good shots. I'm just like walking around, just hold the camera, I'm just letting you do your thing. I would say the level of efficiency that you guys worked at was amazing. I mean, I would, it was just incredible to see. You guys are just nonstop. I'm pretty sure he could walk away and just let the whole thing run, and be back in the back, pushing buttons, and it would have ran itself. It was awesome. Just watching all of you guys work and and the solutions you're coming up with and the ideas, like when um, they saw something out the window and immediately people started suggesting, well, it could be part of our Saturn rocket or, you know, just all those things that you're know, like, okay, they are paying attention um, and into it. What was that? That, friends, was the Apollo Gamma astronauts inquiring as to the presence of any man-made object close to them. And there isn't one that we know of. Roger that. We're seeing a reflection of something we can't identify. Something relatively close to us, a few miles away, maybe. This isn't a far-fetched UFO sighting. This actually happened on Apollo 11. The astronauts carefully worded their inquiries back to NASA, and no one so much as whispered the word UFO until they were on the ground back in Houston. Okay, what would you say the most stressful thing so far has been? Uh, probably the unidentified piece of debris that we just saw that very well could have been another object of ours 6,000 miles off course. Ultimately, it was theorized that the light the astronauts saw shining off metal near their spacecraft was a hatch cover. I think it might be a panel of the SRB's LM cover, whatever it is. It is an impacting us by path. Thank you, Houston. Help. UFOs on Apollo 11. Sounds like bad fiction, but it happened. All right. ECOM, Capcom. We're going to do a systems checklist. Capcom, why don't you tell Apollo we're about to do a systems check? And so the work continues. Completing the TLI, the translunar injection, pushing the spacecraft out of Earth's orbit and towards the moon. So I just completed the translunar injection. It was stressful because I was the one relaying the steps, but it all worked out, and I hope the lunar orbit insertion, which is the next big step, goes just as soon as the insertion check with e confirm that 
that concludes the insertion checklist. We're ready. We're ready. Then retrieving the lunar module. Then, as shifts change and new teams arrive on the consoles, debriefing on what has occurred and what challenges remain ahead. Five minutes of the job were very stressful. They're like, oh, that's just a group there. We don't know what to do. Ah, someone get the um, problem thing to Jiggy so we can learn what to do. I was like, it's like, are we supposed to say it out loud? Yeah, say it out loud. Stop with the words. Next thing you know, okay, we're good. Yeah, so everybody's doing yeah. good out there in space. Yeah. So where are the astronauts currently? The flight controllers are making sure everything is working as well as it should, and that includes the astronauts themselves. There are frequent crew status checks scheduled throughout the flight, and the crew's vitals are constantly monitored by a team of flight surgeons. From monitoring food intake to watching the astronauts' heart rate, the surgeons are on top of things. I'm going to do it here. Um, I've been experiencing Early on, the loss of gravity caused one of the astronauts to experience some nausea, a common occurrence caused, we think, by an inner ear suddenly becoming very confused about which way is up. Um, we hear some nausea med medication, actually motion sickness medication, and she was all right. Her heart rate was a little bit concerning, um, but we don't know what her normal is, so we'll just continue to monitor that and see how it goes. Nothing a few aspirin can't fix. All right, we're gonna do the lovely, lovely procedure known as the waist dump. Beth, press dump A. Roger, dump A press. Another job causing stress is a task facing the flight activities officers, the FAOs, who are using a decidedly low-tech chalkboard to keep everyone abreast of the flight schedule, updating constantly to reflect changes. Okay, I think whenever it got, like, real for me was whenever it was, like, I was up there and, like, started writing things on the board, like, of course I had my teammates to help me, but it was, like, scary because sometimes we wouldn't get the times everything and everything, like, at that moment when everyone needed it because they were all so busy and we wouldn't get the checklists right and we'd be, like, so scared, like, what if we write something down wrong? What if we mess up the times? And it was, like, really scary. Another issue appears. Intermittently, the power output of the three power cells on Apollo Gamma are dropping several points. While still above redline, this is disconcerting. Power loss in space can be the ultimate game changer and game ender. So right now what's happening is that our fuel cells are dropping. The three fuel cells, which normally pump out 37 volts, drop to about 28. Red line is somewhere around 25. These are the kinds of issues our Tiger team is meant to handle, and they are on the case. I was told once to crunch numbers. <laughs> what numbers do you want me to crunch? Okay, so our fuel cells, they are back up to 37. Our O2, 1, and H2, 1, and 2, they both dropped, but that's that's fine. They're going to drop. Uh, but our batteries, they're back up as well, so it's looking good right now. So all good right now, but everything can change. So. Fuel cell 2 at 25, confirmed. Finding your way in space isn't as easy as pointing the nose of the ship at the moon. Complex calculations are needed, and periodically, a course correction is required. A burn of the engine on the service module to nudge the spacecraft back into the correct alignment. These calculations, even simplified for our project, are nothing to sneeze at. It was a, it was a very fun experience, you know, with my math. I, I'm really not, I really don't find math that fun, but today was really fun. And like being immersed in like the whole space scene like you, that you see in movies. Uh, Commander Seth, set FDAI to orbital rate. Commander Seth, set FDAI to orbital rate. Go. Okay. Any concerns? Burnt. Yeah. Math. <laughs> 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 Everything's 
looking good. We're right now working on the PTC reestablishment to that barbecue roll, that barbecue roll to make sure that one side doesn't freeze, one side doesn't burn because of the uh, the conditions in space. So we're working on that right now, uh, and then we'll move to our third translunar coast period. Okay. Shift change. The time has come to put the spacecraft into lunar orbit. Fire up the lunar module and prepare to land on the moon. My feet hurt. A lot. I'm on my first coffee. And it probably won't be my last. It's very stressful. Seth, confirm, burn, shut down. Apollo Gamma is in orbit around the moon. There's nowhere left to go but down to the lunar surface. Every department is focusing in. Mission control is a beehive of activity. A lot has to be done. Every department has to be prepared for any eventuality. The lunar module, or LIM, has to be prepared for descent. Calculations have to be made for engine burns on the way to the surface. So if it's, if it's, uh, I need to look at this. No, 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 no. If it's retrograde, then we'll be going up and over. So we need to increase braking, basically, and get back on the line. If it's retrograde, it will be going lower, and we'll thrust back on. Got it. Surgeons are keeping a wary eye on medical data for our astronauts. Um, honestly, the most stressful part is about to come up. Um, we have Seth and Michelle transferring to the lunar module. You can go a little bit wrong, so we're just keeping a really close eye on their vitals and try and catch anything early. Alright, we are go for power descent. The time has come. The limb separates from the command module with two of our astronauts inside and begins the powered descent. A short journey to the sea of tranquility on the moon. Verify guidance control set to PGNS. program alarm. The LIMS computer is reporting something is wrong. This happened repeatedly to Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin as they made their power descent. Their mission control reached the same conclusion ours does. The computer is being asked to do too many things at once, but the program alarm shouldn't impact the landing. The LIM continues its journey. When we had the second um, alarm, oh, yeah. because she, uh, Gabby saw it and then I was like, okay, I know exactly where it is, let me get to it, figured out exactly what to do, went up, went to Capcom, and it was just like, yep, bam, bam, bam. At a certain point, all Mission Control can do is sit back and listen as the astronauts complete their descent. They wait for news of success or tragic failure. Feet, 
quite a giant leap for mankind, but still a triumph for these students. They've worked together, tackled obstacles, solved problems, faced adversity, and now victory is sweet. Apollo Gamma has landed astronauts on the moon. So we just finished the lunar descent. For me, it was probably the most stressful part of the mission so far. And we just finished the, uh, the descent onto the moon, and we made it successfully, so... That was great. A little stressful though. So that was fun. Very stressful. A lot of numbers, a lot of math, quick math. Uh, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of. Yeah. Roger that, Apollo. You made history in this episode. No one's We made history. That's right. A cinematic hero of mine once said that when you're one step from your goal is usually when the ground falls out from underneath your feet. These students are about to find out just how true that is when it comes to space flight. The lunar module has left the moon and docked with the command module. All that remains is a simple goal, to go home. But problems are starting to pop up. Power levels on the command module are still fluctuating and one of the astronauts is reporting strange symptoms. Commander Seth, how are you feeling? Later, students will recognize that these were warning signs of a bigger problem. But they are about to be distracted. A standard checklist item the replacement of the command module's CO2 filter has failed. Beth, confirm CO2 gauge level falling. CO2 levels are absurd right now. It's not falling. CO2 is not falling. Something went wrong with one of the filters and it's not working. All of the CO2 filters on the command module didn't work. 
We had four stairs and none of them worked. We need to make sure that it doesn't go up one floor or we're going to have people passing out. So we had to send uh, Seth to the lunar module for them to get uh, the spare from there. Surgeon, Ecom, I need you over here at flight. Okay, we got a problem. Now the thing is, the spare from the limb is bigger than the the box for the CO2 filter in the command module, where it needs to go. This is similar to a situation faced by the Apollo 13 space flight. The solution in real life, and in this room, is the same. Find a way to make a round peg fit into a square hole. The thing that I'm going to talk about is when I threw a box of things at my team, and as we were getting yelled at that the CO2 was going to kill the astronauts, they said, if you don't fix it, they're going to die. <laughs> so this is our model of what they're working with, but this is the shape that we've got to work with. So we need to figure out how we can get this filter. Just being dumped with this, bo this box of junk and having to go through it and say, what can we even use, you know? So we have to make this makeshift sort of new CO2 filter to fix the issue that's going on. So far, we have had a lot of uh, a lot of problems, which is really fun because then we all uh, we all crowd around one place and we uh, figure out how to solve it. And most of the time, we do is when we, when we were building it, it was it was so stressful, and everyone was like racing towards us and saying. Like the, um, the CO2 level was at 8 and it's like it's going to touch 9. Uh, everybody has a different idea of how to solve it and we can't use all the onions so it's hard to uh, communicate with each other and figure out which solution to use. And we were trying things and nothing was working quite right and then um, Helena and Joseph both came in. So she stepped in with a idea and got everyone to go for it and then I started grabbing pieces and taping things together and give tape to people and pieces to other people uh, and then it came together just in the nick of time. Oh my gosh, it was just crazy. So CO2 levels are just one over here. Okay. Okay. Keep watching it. Just make sure it doesn't go. One crisis is enough, right? Maybe so, but Mission Control is about to be handed a second before the first is sorted. It starts when the flight controller in charge of the spacecraft's electrical systems notices a plunge in the power output from the power cells. Then everyone notices. Hey, what's the problem? What's the problem? On Apollo 13, a massive explosion crippled the spacecraft and made the astronauts reliant on the power generated by the limb batteries. Apollo Gamma has just had a similar occurrence. We have got to shut down stuff right now. One of the tanks appears to have burst, though the damage is not as catastrophic as on Apollo 13. Everyone's completely panicking now uh, because um, power's going crazy and H2 and O2 are going crazy. I also really appreciated how you used the example of an oxygen tank exploding at least twice during orientation. <laughs> yeah. And then it happened. You said we lost all the O2 on tank one. It's not raining at all. That would be consistent with our motion out here. Okay, if we're yeah, missing oxygen, that, that would be that enough for us to yeah. push up around. I, I enjoyed sitting back there, especially when the CO2 was rising, and then and then we had the lights where we were like yelling, this is blowing up, and this is blowing up, and everything, all of the lights are off. And, what, and so after we hung up, we just 
it was very quiet back there, and we were just kind of sitting quietly, and I had my knitting. And, I was knitting, and we were going, they're all freaking out, aren't they? How long can it last? working on a power margin of nothing. We're running really work on battery right now. We've been cutting off things like crazy and planning ahead what we're gonna cut off. Edit it off. off the, we could turn it off. Okay, so team. we've already, here. All right, I'm just gonna yeah. already turned he off. asked us, what if it was 50 and what if it was 40? Oh. So. We're cutting off things that we even need as a flash. Yeah. Yeah. We turned off the radio. Well, we we don't use it either. Yeah. We don't, one by one, they turn off non-vital systems, looking for every single advantage. We're all tired and we're all trying to get the astronauts back safe. One thing that I need to watch out for is whenever things have been going suspiciously right, yeah. Oh, yeah. I would look over, look quiet. I would look over at Mr. Hamrick when he thought no one was looking and he would have his Apollo coffee cup and he would just go, <laughs> the first American in space, Alan Shepard, was diagnosed after his first flight with a rare condition called Meniere's disease. Characterized by unpredictable attacks of crippling vertigo, nausea, and tinnitus, it was a condition that, if Shepard had been in space during an episode, would have been catastrophic. In real life, Shepard would have an inner ear surgery that allowed him to return to space during the Apollo program. We have one more thing left. Sir, doesn't it, but if you can't wait the checklist, then should I sign it? Okay, Capcom, wait. 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 That sound right. Lay down. Commander Seth, are you feeling all right? And then when Mr. Duban was like, we're going down. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, Sam Seth is definitely feeling most of the sickness. Um, his nausea is not relented. Has he mentioned dizziness? Our flight's commander has just shown us what could have happened. He's had a Meniere's attack in space during a crisis. All right, flights, we got one astronaut down. Our team of three astronauts is down to two, with their commander incapacitated and power rates falling. The Earth is starting to loom awfully large in Apollo Gamma's window. Tired, stressed, Mission Control prepares to bring the spacecraft home. Apollo Gamma has traveled almost a half a million miles. Hi folks! We got SPF separation left, and then it's just re-entry. This is the end. Her astronauts have landed on the moon and have come home. However it ends, you guys have done a great job. All right, I'm gonna do it one more time around the horn, go, no, go for re-entry. So, booster. Go. Go. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guido. Go. Surgeons. Go. Capcom. Go. Ecom. Go. GNC. Go. Telcom. Go. Control. Go. FB. Go. FAO. Go. Go. PAO. All right, retro, we're good for starting that re-entry checklist. Let them know we're about to start. Verifying program 63 running, C2. Okay. Now, we wait as the immense heat of re-entry prevents communication with the spacecraft. We wait and hope. Blackout should last no longer than three minutes. On Apollo 13, that time stretched an additional minute. On Apollo Gamma, the time to reacquire the spacecraft signal comes and goes. All right, Capcom, let's try to reacquire. Apollo, this is Houston. Do you copy? They're giving me a plus count. Okay. Capcom, keep calling. Apollo, this is Houston. Do you copy? Plus 20 seconds. Keep going, Capcom. Apollo, this is Houston. Do you copy? Plus 20 seconds. 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 Plus 20 secon
last 30 seconds. Apollo, this is Houston. Do you read me? Apollo, Houston, do you copy? Entering 50. Apollo, Houston, do you copy? One minute. These students prepared for over a month for this moment. They stayed focused through a sleepless, stress-filled night. They cooperated, they planned, they brainstormed, they solved problems. This is what education is all about. It's also what the Apollo program was all about, what John Kennedy was talking about back in 1962. Maybe it's no coincidence that these students started looking up into space as our nation took the first steps to return to the moon. At this time, I give you a go to resume count and launch Artemis 1. In the fall of 2022, before memories of their night with Apollo Gamma had time to fade, these students could switch on the television and watch Artemis 1 lift off and head for the stars. And lift off of Artemis 1. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. I wonder, will they keep looking up over the years? And remember that time they proved they had the right stuff to make the voyage from the Earth to the Moon. <laughs>